there's a huge paradox. So we basically live in the most prosperous time in the history of human civilization. Life is pretty good on the surface, yet so many young people are filled with doom and gloom. Certain social media platforms will move the negative posts. So the ones that are going to create more friction and responses to the top of your list. So they're almost, you know, trying to create negativity to get you to engage with them. News is the same way. You rarely hear in the news all the good things that are happening in the world. You hear about all the bad things, right? Because they're using that to, to suck you in and make you recognize the bad. And you get the doom and gloom. Hi, Mark. Thank you so much for being here and, and for giving your time to me and my audience. Uh, can you please just introduce yourself? Tell us a little bit about yourself and what brings you here in your life journey. Absolutely, Mike. I appreciate the opportunity to be here and talk about myself and Take Two Minutes. Um, I'm the founder of Take Two Minutes. Take Two Minutes.org is a non profit that helps individuals with mental well-being. We have all kinds of activities on the site that we can cover during our discussion today, but ultimately mm -hmm. I'm the founder of Take Two Minutes and it's a nonprofit to help people get into a better mindset. Great, thank you. And yeah, I definitely want to do some of these practices as we go through here. Can you tell us a little bit about your personal journey which led to the creation of Take Two Minutes? I think a lot of and it's not always a focus per se, but a lot of the focus of my work is around the personal journey and what brings people to where they are. So can you tell us a bit about that? Absolutely. I think it's a good story. It's a bit of a long one, so I'll try to not uh, know, your time. Yeah. <laughs> go too long with this story. But I started practicing yoga well over a decade ago, probably 12 years ago. And I realized the yoga uh, and meditation in the morning, one of the two kind of helped me calm and get into a better mindset. And sometimes I kind of mixed meditation with yoga where I got into a pose and then kind of just sat there for a few minutes and tried to clear my mind and focus on breathing. And so it was a combination of yoga and meditation, which helped me move away from the stresses of life and start my day off with a fresh start and kind of calm and get into that positive mindset. And a few things happened after I started doing yoga in the following years that I think all led up to what is Take Two Minutes Now. One is when I go out in my little community, and I live in a relatively small town that um, I try to you know, frequent local stores and not the big box stores, I was told oftentimes by various stores, various people, that when I come into the store, once I leave, the the staff has a shift in their mindset for up to an hour afterwards just because I'm pleasant and friendly to them. And I thought that's interesting that me going someplace and just saying hi and showing compassion to people who are there, whether they be strangers or not, would change how those employees were feeling about their day. And it was actually enough where I was being told it was actually happening, which I also thought was interesting. And then add to that. My older son, who's actually a part of Take Two Minutes now, he helps a lot. He was in high school at this time, and he was struggling a bit with high school problems. And I, I use that term loosely because high school problems can be different for every individual. They could be severe. They could be minimal. But in my mind, they were relatively minimal, but still high school problems that were causing him distress and a little bit of depression. And so I started texting him a daily a positive message every day, just something letting him know he's loved, letting me know those people out there care about him and trying to give him uh, an up shift in his mood around noon every day. We put all this together and I realized that most of my positive thoughts were happening on my yoga mat at like five in the morning, which at five in the morning is not the best time to text my son a positive message. He was still in bed and not in high school yet, not, not in school and not having the school problems. And so being my developer background, I wrote a little application that allowed me to take my cell phone while on the yoga mat <clears throat> and just text a message to a phone number. And it would throw that message into a Google Doc. I could go to my desk later on, found out the message, make it better. Better. And then the application would pick a message that had not been sent to him yet and sent it to him automatically. So I kind of made this automated process that allowed me to facilitate sending him positive messages. Mm -hmm. After he started receiving these, one, he enjoyed them. He liked them. It was a nice little feel good in the middle of his day. But I had a few other people who were interested in them and added, hey, I wouldn't mind getting them also. And so I made it where you could join the messages. And I think I had 12 people getting my daily positive messages and it was, it made me feel good. P other people were liking it. It was a conversation piece for those 12 people. It was all good. 
Well, one day I was in one of the local stores I frequent, I mentioned earlier, mm -hmm. and the person behind the counter was talking about the message they received that day because they were getting the positive messages every day. And a complete stranger in line behind me pipes up and says, I, I think I get your messages also, which I had no idea who it was, which led me to go home and look at my database. Mm -hmm. And I had 300 people getting these messages. Wow. And I was kind of taken back that I thought it was 12 people and it was around 300 people getting these messages. At which point in time, I had this epiphany that I need, need to do more with this. It needs to be more than just positive messages I created. It needs to have some backing. It needs to have some data behind it. And I reached out to my network of acquaintances and found I had a contact with a, a psychologist out of Duke University. He had been studying resilience and positivity in healthcare workers and students for about seven years. And he had about 40,000 people go through his studies, and he had some really good data on how to help people get into a better positive mindset. He was happy to spend countless hours on the phone with me over the course of three, four, five weeks talking about his studies and his data. And all of that is what led into me thinking, I'm going to create a system that does all these things that he's been studying and helps people get into a better mindset. Wow. So. It's the shortest verse I could probably go with. Sure, sure. That's pretty good. <laughs> That's pretty concise. And I have so many questions floating through my mind. I get, one would be, can you give an example, I guess, maybe of a couple of the messages that you send out? Or like, how do you keep a, a roster of them? Or, or do you continue to seek out different quotes? Like, what does it sort of sound like, I guess? Yeah. Right. So a couple of things about that. The application is a lot more now than positive messages. Positive messages is one aspect out of about 10 yeah. that this, okay. the system does. Yeah. But the positive messages are still very much liked. I have a lot of users who sign up really just to get the positive messages, which is astonishing to me. But to what you've asked, they they have broadened out quite a bit. I think the database now has 1,600 messages. About 400 of those are really focused on Young adults, I don't want to use the word children, I want to use young adults because if you're of the age, let's say 13 through 17, 16 maybe, there's about 400 messages that have been created to target that age group. And they've been created by counselors and therapists, school therapists that I was able to get in contact with to help write messages that are more targeted at middle school type youths. So there's a whole subset, 400 of those. In addition to those 400 meant for young adults, there's about 1,200 meant for anyone. And those 1,200 are kind of broken into positivity messages, self-care messages. You mentioned quotes. There's a, easily 100 just quotes from famous people in there, as well as other messages. And I do still curate new messages. And I, I try to, you know, over the course of I guess Take Two Minutes has been active for about five years now. I've tried to go, go through and remove or weed out ones that aren't not being well received. Or obviously, we want to make sure no message triggers anyone. And that's a delicate subject because really anything can trigger anyone. You never really know. But the goal is to take ones that are obviously could be a trigger out and make sure that um, we, we, we avoid those where possible. A lot of the quotes, so going back to the system, it is a chat bot I've created. So okay. it works off of text or SMS. And this was very purposeful. I did this because when I was creating the system, I learned through podcast listening that creators of like Headspace and Calm were having more difficulty reaching their audience through app notifications. And as I did research and studies, I realized that app notifications, if you have an app on your phone, many people have notifications turned off for the apps. They don't get them at all. The people who do get app notifications or still have them turned on for apps, a lot of times ignore them because it's the app selling you something or trying to tell you to do something, which is great. It works great for apps. However, some people in my mind, and when I created this, I thought if someone really needs help, if someone truly wants to get into a better mindset, you want to reach them. You want a communication channel that they're going to read. And in my studies and research, I found that text messaging actually has a 92% read rate within three minutes, meaning that 92% of all text messages that are sent are read within three minutes. And so I went down the path of text messaging. Since it's a text messaging focused system, I had to make a chat bot so the chat bot could recognize messages you were sending back. This is where this is all going is you can send things back like, I want a, a quote by somebody and it's going to return back to you a quote 
from somebody, or you can say, I want a positive message now. It's going to send you a positive message back as a response. So you can actually, in addition to your scheduled daily positive messages, which some people have set up, I guess there's different times people do that. I've been told that's interesting. Some of the uh, people who reach out to me say, I get my positive message every day at 4 p.m. Because in my mind, that's a transition from when my work stops to my personal life starts. And I want that positivity right then. Some people tell me I want it at eight in the morning. But ultimately, the chat bot, again, you can send to it, send my positive messages every day at 8 a.m. It's going to take that message and set your reminder or set your your positive message yes. delivery time for 8 a.m. That's a lot more than you asked about. So I'll pause there and wait for the no, next No, yeah, that was the creative entrepreneurial spirit in me was is very much enjoying that. Uh, yeah, that's, yeah so creative, that's so creative and just the whole process the whole of process. thinking how to integrate all of that. I think maybe you mentioned Calm and Headspace. I think you said Headspace was the other one. Yeah. Uh, maybe just get right into the sort of some of the psychology. So in, I assume you've heard some of the or maybe some people push back a little bit on the idea of positive psychology or, and I know it's not always necessarily fair, but I think it's important to talk about it. How do you balance, or maybe you have this integrated in terms of this idea of sort of pretending things are good when they're not or false positivity or, and I, and I know that positive psychology sort of doesn't imply that or isn't like that per se. But I think it gives off the the impression that it often is. And then I'm not sure if you're familiar with this term mindfulness. I do think uh, it applies a little bit to things like calm in particular, where it sort of becomes commodified, this whole spiritual, if you will, or human growth development intention it sort of gets commodified and, and turned into, for lack of a better word, cheap messages that are not so thorough and effective. Anyway, I'm also saying a lot and asking a bunch of different questions, but maybe you could just try to make sense of all of that and and, and respond. Yeah. Yeah. So you hit on a few things, like you said there, and one is, you know, false positivity. And, and I think with anything, so first off, there's no one solution that's going to work for everybody, right? I mean, that's the reason why there are different options in the world. That's why there is a calm and a headspace and a take two minutes. And there's other ones out there as well. There's different ways. And there's, you know, there's still a need for therapy and counseling, right? So all these things are needed. And the reason being is there's no one solution that's going to work for the whole world. That's never going to actually happen. So the goal is to get people different ways of accomplishing Mm -hmm. the, the positive psychology avenue for those who want to partake in it. I don't necessarily promote false positivity. That's not the goal of Take Two Minutes. The goal of Take Two Minutes and positive psychology, in my mind, is to recognize how to get yourself into a better mindset. I mean, to be honest with you, I have bad days. Everyone has bad days. I I have a a whole application I've developed myself that's all around positive psychology, but I still have difficult days. There's still days where... You know, the world seems out to get me. I'm down, whatever you want, to, whatever you want to call it, right? You're just like, yeah. there's this days I'm like, I oh, pass this. And so the benefit of positive psychology, in my mind, is to have you be able to recognize those days and know how to shift your attitude quicker than you would or quicker than getting into a slump and a downward spiral where you can't shift it, right? So we're all going to experience those days. And I'm not going to say you should falsely just be happy because you're having a bad day. That's not the goal. You need to recognize your emotions also. And, you know, that's a a good transition too. is anxiety. Take two minutes does a lot to help people with anxiety, but anxiety is an emotion. And there is some value to recognizing that emotion and internalizing it and, and understanding where it's coming from and and what it's doing to you and trying to move past that. And that's all learning a lot of, you know, a lot of it's learning. It's not all learning, but I think a lot of it is learning and helping people recognize how to do it. There's a quote by Barbara Fredrickson I've used a lot, and I I misquote this all the time. So this is going to be the exact quote. So I apologize if, if whoever's listening, but she said something like the negatives yell at you but the positives only whisper. And so the idea of positive psychology is that, is to start, is to recognize the positives so that when you are in a slump, when you are having a bad day or a bad week, you can recognize those positives and dig yourself out of it. So then the next day, maybe you're having a better day. And the day after that is even a better day. And I think some of those are the other values and benefits of positive psychology. Yeah, I 
I think I interpret that as, or, or I've heard it said sort of, the, our brains are sponges for negative information and Teflon for positive ones. And, True. That's and, a good yeah, one. Yeah. And we do need to cultivate that practice for sure. So if I understand the story was sort of, you started practicing some yoga meditation, you started expressing some of these more pleasant thoughts sending them to your son, he was finding them helpful. Were you aware of positive psychology at the time? Or how did that transition happen? Yeah. yeah, That's good. No, I was not aware of positive psychology at the time. I just knew that I was trying to make the best out every day myself and, mm -hmm. and going through some of those activities of positive psychology. I yeah. was recognizing gratitude. I wasn't journaling. Uh, I wasn't journaling gratitude which obviously is a, a, a large, large activity that can greatly help with, with recognizing positivity. And I, I want to talk about that a little later on. But ultimately, I wasn't doing anything around that. It was more the epiphany when I was talking to the doctor out of Duke University and the understanding of what pos positive psychology was, the realization that I was actually doing some of these things without recognizing it was positive psychology. And so it's through the learnings of, of his, he shared with me that I was able to learn more about what positive psychology was. And that was 2017 or 2018, I think, is when I started learning more about the whole idea of positive psychology. How did you get into yoga? <laughs> Just kind of curious. Yeah, yeah. It's a good question. I have to think back on that one. I think going back, that was, you know, that was over a decade ago, probably 12 years ago. So I have a, I had a back injury in the early 2000s. And I think Back then, I was young and naive, and well, we could go down a, a spiral with this one here, but I, I, I was doing what Western medicine doctors told me to do, and which was do nothing and take medicine, right? Yeah. And um, doing nothing and taking medicine wasn't healing my back. Uh, and they they said it's not enough for surgery, whatever. It uh, unfortunately was a negative time in my life that spanned about two years of me taking prescription medication for my mm -hmm. back. And it wasn't healing, wasn't getting it better, it was constant pain. And at some point in time, I went to a physical therapist finally without without being prescribed one by a doctor, if you can believe yeah. that. It was my own accord. I was like, I got to find a way to fix this. Yeah. And the physical therapist gave me some exercises to do at home. And some of them were somewhat touching on yoga, I, I would say. And it, it was helping my back. I was like, oh, this is actually fixing things. And a lot of the back injury was, you know, was really spasming muscles that weren't going away because I was never doing anything to fix them. I was sitting around all the time because the doctors told me just to sit and do nothing and let it heal. And it wasn't, it wasn't working out. Yeah. So <laughs> the uh, physical therapist with a little bit of yoga, I was like, I should, I should try some yoga because this, what I'm doing right now is making it feel better. Maybe if I do yoga and strengthen my core and everything and that sure enough, made my back much better. And it, it, you know, like anything, it's not an instant fix, but over the course of six, 12 months, my back pain went away and my, my core got more strong and strengthened. I, I guess, grew a love for yoga at that point in time. Yeah. Great. Thanks. Yeah. I'm always kind of curious what sparks people's change or, or yeah. transitions. And yeah, I think there's something really valuable about those experiential practices. And are you familiar, it's a bit of a side note, uh, with MBSR, like mindfulness-based stress reduction? I'm not. This is okay. a new one for me. Sure. Yeah. It's sort of, uh, I guess the reason I asked it was developed to treat chronic pain for people okay. who are not responding to surgery or pain medication. And it's sort of a big reason why mindfulness was embraced by the western medical system basically it's like a nine-week program that uh, anyway i was just curious because a lot of people find their way into yoga and meditation through that program due to back pain basically right or other types of chronic pain and there is a yoga component to it and a meditation component to it anyway that's sort of why i was just asking it was a big no, look it up yeah it was it was great john kabat zinn i don't know if you've heard of that guy before but he's a pretty well-known uh, mindfulness person Okay, so all this stuff's happening in your life. Your maybe can you just touch a bit about your tech background or your IT back? Like how how your knack for technology coincided with this personal journey and, and just, right. yeah, I started my young childhood programming computers um, wow. back in the eighties. Uh -huh. My mother and father were getting a divorce. Uh, I think I was bought a computer to pass my time in 83, give me something to do. Yeah. I, I 
you know, at, at that young age of 12 or 13, I don't think I had any knowledge. Well, that was 83, right? Not, a lot of people right, didn't have right, knowledge right. of computers back right. then, but I was given a computer and told to have fun with it. And I instantly started programming. And for some reason, at 13 years old and 83, programming became natural to me. I was like, oh, this is easy. Then uh, I guess I, looking back, I didn't realize my propensity to troubleshoot or, or problem solve. Uh, and that's what I was doing as a young child was problem solving via computers. And when I say problem solving, I didn't know this when I was 13. But when I got older, I recognized what I was really doing was hacking uh, at that <laughs> point in time. Go, fast forwarding into college in the 90s, my counselor as a college counselor does kept asking me, what are you going to do with your life? And my answer is like, I don't know. I have, you know, just going through college. And he goes, why are you here? I'm like, I'm supposed to be, I, I think. It's part of life. You go to college. And one day he uh, was a ju junior in college, I think. And he goes, you need to figure out what you're going to do with your life. And I had no idea still. And he said, have you considered getting into computers? You talk about computers a lot. Maybe that can be your profession. And I literally, this is 1993, 94 timeframe. My response back was, you mean people would pay me for that kind of stuff? Because <laughs> I had no idea that there was a, a profession for computers. I was maybe naive, maybe living in a rock. I had no idea, but I didn't know. And so I was like, yeah, I can do that. And that was my start into my career with computers. I think I got my first job immediately out of college in 95. And since then, I just continued um, to, you know, I shouldn't say I haven't job hopped, but my career has progressed in different mm -hmm. capacities around computers. And the, the Good thing in hindsight for me, I can't say it was planned. It was more my personality. My personality is I'm really, what's the best way of saying it? I am, I'm challenged at doing the same thing repeatedly for too long. That's a positive spin on it, I think. I'm challenged at doing the same thing for too long. So because of my challenge there, I went across a lot of different types of professions with computers, meaning that I've programmed 17 different languages. I've been a network administrator. I've been a database administrator. I've been a security administrator. And I think because of all those things, it led me ultimately now to my current career where I'm a CIO at a company and, and I'm able to recognize all areas of technology. So I don't necessarily specialize in programming anymore. I don't specialize in networks. I kind of get it all with regards to technology. And the nice part there is I'm able to properly lead a team or properly develop a system like take two minutes that takes all those into account and make sure there's redundancy, security, uh, there's privacy with the data. And I can help an, a company or take two minutes with all the areas of technology. Cool. And, and the thoughts I'm having are something around the value of all of that and your ability to turn that into this take two minutes practice. And how do you, I, I don't know if you're familiar with the, the problem solving mind, observing mind kind of sort of when it comes to our emotions and our negative, negative experiences, the impulse for that problem solving mind to jump in and try to fix and, and make go away the suffering, if you will. How, number one, I guess, do you, are you, do you know what I'm talking about? I know I'm not being super precise. And then two, how do you distinguished between your capacity to solve problems sort of in the material mathematics or coding world versus a psychological problem, if you will. Does that make sense, those two things? It does. Yeah, yeah it does. And the psychological part, I don't know if I can speak to as much because I, you, I understood what you were saying because okay. I do have that problem-solving mindset. <clears throat> it almost to a fault in that when I do have a little bit of anxiety. You know, I, I, and I do. I mean, even though I, I've created Take Two Minutes, I recognize yoga, I meditate, there are still times or situations which cause me anxiety. And I find that I really start dwelling on trying to understand the root cause of where that anxiety is coming from. And I try to solve the problem as to you know, what made this happen so I can fix it. That's not always the case. You can't always really fix your emotions, right? But I find myself trying to. I, tried, I, I almost overly dwell on it sometimes. So I, I get that. And that is part of the problem-solving mindset. And I think, it, I think in some situations, you can fix it um, mm -hmm. by solving a problem in some situations. So I'll give you an example. It took me a while to realize... 
I don't know, let's use a hypothetical situation here. I have to go uh, to a crowded restaurant on a night. I know it's going to be crowded. There's going to be a lot of people there and I, and I don't want to go and I'm going to have anxiety about it because I don't like crowds. I don't like noisy places, all that kind of stuff. And then when I start solving that problem, I realize, well, doing this is going to help me next time not have as much anxiety. And it's something I have to do. So let's suck it up and do it and experience it. If I'm there and I'm having the anxiety, let's maybe do some breath work to help calm myself down and just try to work through it. And I and I do believe that doing those things, doing the things you don't want to do sometimes helps you get into a better place in the future when you have similar situations. And that's an example of problem solving yeah. in my mind that helps in these situations because the yeah. understanding of what's causing these things, causing these uh, discomforts in you can help you overcome those in the future. And that's not going to work for all situations. That's just an example of one. Yeah, that's a great one. I think maybe maybe you could talk a little bit about or, or if the take two minutes thing or even positive psychology applies to how young people i do a lot of not so much anymore i used to do a lot of work in schools or with high school students primarily i do a lot more with parent councils now or whatever but how how our aversion to suffering or parents aversion to watching their kids suffer right or helping them toler learn to tolerate kind of like what you're you sort of described a bit of my life experience too. I don't like crowds that much anymore. I don't like, and I get anxious and then I want to avoid. And, and same thing for me. I know it's helpful for me to go and to soothe and to realize I actually enjoy being in those environments. I just don't like some of the the noise, I guess, or just the too much things going on in my mind. But right. yeah, so maybe I, I do think over the past 10, 20 years, and this isn't new, really to anybody, but we have been too overprotective of young people, for sure, and not helping them understand how to suffer or how right. to process suffering, if you will. I guess I'm curious, you know, the, the example you gave of the restaurant is a good one. Oftentimes, we, we allow kids to avoid things, assuming we're helping them while we're not. And maybe, is there anything kind of that you've come up with in your work or through the app that helps people with that? Or maybe you could just speak to that in general. Yeah. Right. No, and that's a, a known, but a good observation. And I, it's interesting. I have two kids. I talked about one already, the younger one who's are in his teens, but I've recognized that as a parent. And I think it's, I don't know if it's generational or not, but ultimately you, we have reached a point where we try to protect our children possibly more than we did in the past. I know when I was a kid, you know, like, Go out, you'd go outside, ride your bike, go wherever, ride all, all around town. Parents had no idea where you're at. There was no communication. There was no cell phones. You're supposed to be home before it got dark. Because you remember back, I think there was a joke about this, a meme on uh, YouTube or Reddit or something a while back about how back in the day there was a commercial at 10 o'clock at, at night saying, it's 10 o'clock at night. Do you know where your kids are? <laughs> because <laughs> the kids are just out, you know, doing things all the time. That's not the case anymore. Even me, as someone who is in the positive psychology and creator now, I still shelter my younger one a little bit more trying to protect him. But at the same time, I, I try to recognize it and make smart decisions. If you know something's going to hurt them, definitely you shouldn't let them yeah, do it. Yeah. But I, I do try to catch myself. Like I remember when my younger, who's again now a teenager, when he was, I don't know, seven or eight, let's say, he wanted to uh, ride the bus home and walk home from the bus stop instead of, you know, all the kids' parents pick them up at the bus stop and walk them home. And my wife was like, no, you're going to go pick him up. And I was like, I don't know. I think he's going to be fine walking from the bus stop. And so the first time, of course, I kind of went as close as I could see, so I could see him walking, but I made sure he didn't see me looking at him. But I let him you know, walk home on his own. And it got to the point, it's like, yeah, he can do this. And so I started letting him walk home on his own. And it's taking, of course, if you live in a bad area, that might be a bad. Sure. I'm not sure. saying anyone should do that. I'm giving it an example yeah. that I think yeah. my area is pretty safe and it was going to be okay for him to do so. And release the leash a little bit, let's call it. And so I've tried to progress in those things when he doesn't want to do something and I know it's not going to hurt him. I just explain, listen, this is a situation where you're going to do something you don't want to do, but that's good for you because one, it's going to be learning. Two, it's going to be experience and it's going to help you get in, to be a, be a better person. So I try to push him a little bit to do those things. Now, take two minutes. I can't say it has any activities around that. 
Okay. okay. I do have activities for parents, mm. and I'm going to touch on one of them. Yeah, um, please. Yeah. I have, and this is as terrible. I think that absolutely terrible. And the fact that since I've started take two minutes, I've probably had more conversations than I care to have with a parent who's either child or a child's friend attempted suicide. And I, I really dislike those discussions because it's really sad. It's really, it's, it's emotional for me. I mean, mm -hmm. as a parent, I know I would not want to lose a child or have a child be in a position to, to want to try to commit suicide. So I built into Take Two Minutes a function, I call it groups, and it's used for a lot of use cases now. But for parents, a parent can join Take Two Minutes and buy an extra license and give the license to their child. They can then create a group and invite their child to the group, and it allows them, the parent, to see which activities their child is doing in Take Two Minutes. Since Take Two Minutes has a bunch of things around journaling and um, uh, writings, let's just call them, you know, if you go back in the day, the 80s and 90s, there was diaries for girls quite often. That was a girl thing, not a guy thing. But, you know, now it's just journaling is what it is, and it's acceptable for anyone to do it. Since there is journaling, the parents cannot still read the child's journal. It's it's blocked from the parents to read the journal. But the good thing is the parents can see that they're actually partaking in activities. And what I'll tell parents is sign up, give your child a license, create the group. I can help you do all that. And then you can have conversations with your child. Listen, I think you need to try meditations. You know, just try one a day for a three minute one, maybe. Or maybe you tell them, I want you to try to gratitude journal. And it, especially at the young adult age, let's say 13 through 17, that's a good age range. I'm, gonna, that's a, I'm just throwing that out of the top of my head, but I think it's a good age range for this example. They might not be good at gratitude journaling, right? They don't necessarily recognize gratitude just yet. And because of that, Take Two Minutes has what's called a gratitude challenge, which a gratitude challenge is the idea that the system will send you a message about something for which you should be grateful, and you should be able to write a statement about why you're grateful for it. That is great for that age group because it gets them into the habit of recognizing gratitude. Once you start recognizing gratitude, you can get into ideally a, a more positive space because this is where you're recognizing the positivity, even though it whispers to you and the negativity screams with the Teflon and um, yeah. sponge. Oh my gosh, sponge. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Teflon and sponge example. Yeah. So it, it, it allows a younger child to, or anyone who doesn't know how to gratitude journal to start getting that practice. But the parent then can see that they are partaking in these activities. So the, the parent can go to their login, look at their child and say, oh, look, yesterday he made two gratitude or he or she made two gratitude journal statements. The parent can then also go and say, hey, I see you wrote something in your gratitude journal. Would you want to talk about what it is? And this is a conversation that could or could not happen there. But the good thing is the parent can see the activities are being done. If they're not being done, it's also a conversation then to say, I notice you haven't done the three good things activity at all. I think that's a good one for you. Would you mind starting it? We can get it set up together and you can start doing it. But it, it allows a conversation piece for the parent to start communicating to the child about positive psychology and how to get them into a better spot. That has though nothing to do with sheltering our kids. It's just a segue into yeah. a, how a parent can help a child using take two minutes. Yeah, that sounds really cool. I think, I don't know how much of the, due to my own life experience, I'm very open and honest about everything with my kids. It's all over the internet anyway, so they'll find out one day. But the Part of the reason I mentioned that is just because it conversations like you just described tend to happen organically in our household. Although I know I understand that's a unique situation. Tons of the parents I work with, and even young people, like in my therapy practice, I do work with a lot of teens. There's such a communication breakdown, and so much of the communication just becomes procedural or filled with tension, right? It, it just becomes, and so it sounds like something like this could be super useful for the kids that are staring at their phones all the time, or not even, but in, in environments where there is a maybe not as open communication about these type of things. And that sounds like a really cool way actually to engage young people in that. And uh, I was having sort of some, I, I often think in images of just like how helpful that type of thing could be in so many different environments. And, and maybe can you maybe transition a little bit into the gratitude, the good things, how I think there's a part of me, the sort of part of me that likes to suffer, you know, and wants to sort of uh, 
what's the word, be contrarian, if you will. It's always there and it always kind of wants to push back on these things. And at the same time, gratitude practice, appreciation, self-compassion, all these kind of experiences are so helpful for me. And I see them, they're so helpful for other people. And so maybe just, can you help us kind of understand the benefits of all these things and what gratitude perhaps means to you or just how you kind of see it helping people and, and what you've learned about that? I think... I'm trying to organize all my thoughts. I had yeah, a big sorry. answer. I, know a lot. I don't ask one question at a time. So it's, <laughs> sorry. it's hard yeah, for me. Yeah. yeah. So you mentioned contrary, and I think that's, yeah. I still think that's valuable. You know, again, we talked on it earlier. There's yeah. no one solution is for everybody. The The goal is even with take two minutes, people can try it and hopefully people like it and want to use it. But if they don't, that's okay, right? It's not, mm -hmm. I'm not trying to promote take two minutes as the end all fix all for everybody. It's something people can try and hopefully it will help. And if they do try and maybe aren't clear with what to do, they can email or text and I'm happy to give suggestions on how to help. And this is leading into what I have found that helps people. And it is around gratitude. It's around gratitude journaling, but more so I, with Take Two Minutes, I've held a few focus groups. The focus groups are largely to validate the effectiveness of Take Two Minutes. I, if, if I started promoting this, I wanted to know it was really helping people. So both times with my focus groups, I picked, I didn't pick. I just did an advertisement on social media and on the website looking for people willing to partake in a focus group who are willing to follow a set of instructions. And I was you know, pretty black and white. You have to follow all the instructions to complete the focus group. And the instructions were... I sort of say pretty simple, but ultimately what the instructions were is you had to sign up for take two minutes. You had to take what's called a modified differential emotion scale questionnaire on day one. And that's an MDES questionnaire. The MDES questionnaire was created as the DES questionnaire in the 70s by Carol Izzard. And it was uh, modified by Barbara Fredrickson again in the 90s to be the modified DES. And the idea behind it is it asks you a series of questions and those questions help your negativity against your positivity. So you have a score of how positive or how negative you are. So the participants took that on day one, and then they were instructed to start gratitude journaling for 30 days. If you didn't know how to gratitude journal, this is where the gratitude challenge came into play. But the idea was you had to recognize gratitude for 30 days. Again, the gratitude challenge in my mind is beautiful because it will help people recognize how to gratitude journal. So if you have somebody who wants to gratitude journal, I've seen this many, many times since I've been doing Take Two Minutes. Take Two Minutes has had about 30,000 people go through the system now. And I've seen oftentimes where someone's like, I want to gratitude journal, but when I sit down with pen or paper or, or phone in hand, ready to text it to your chatbot, I have no thoughts at all. And so the gratitude challenge helps with that. And then once they do it for two weeks, they kind of start recognizing gratitudes. They can take over as a gratitude journal exercise. So anyway, I'm, I'm deviating there. Ultimately, you gratitude journal or gratitude uh, challenge for 30 days. And then about 15 days into your exercise, you start a three good things activity. Now, three good things activity to me is fascinating because it's been researched a lot and it really has shown value in how it works. And the idea behind it is, your three good things activity is going to be at nighttime. Gratitude journaling ideally is when you wake up in the morning or sometime after you wake up. Three good things is ideally before you go to bed, about 90 minutes before you go to bed. And the three good things activity, the way it works is you reflect on the previous day. You reflect on what good things did I witness or what did I do or did happen to me? What's just three good things from the previous day? And you're thinking about these at nighttime again before you go to bed. And it, the application allows you just to you know, type them into your phone and save them. And what this does is it gets your mind into a positive mindset before you go to bed at night. And when you sleep, your subconscious works in that positivity and you wake up recognizing more positivity. And it's um, neuroplasty is what it is. It's, you know, the, the whole theory of rewiring your mind to recognize more positivity. So of the participants in both focus groups who did gratitude journaling for 30 days and three good things for the last 15 days, at day 35, I had them take a second MDS questionnaire. And then we looked at the second MDS questionnaire and compared it to the first MDS questionnaire. Of the so far 33 participants who partook in my focus groups, 31 of them had a 
average of a 200% increase in positivity between the first one and the second one to show how the system is positively affecting people through the practices of recognizing gratitude. And again, there's two different gratitude exercises. There's one's gratitude journaling and one's three good things, but both of them have to do with recognizing gratitude or gratefulness on the day. And I want to add on to that. You, you touched on yourself a bit. And I think at different ages, different age groups, as we progress in life, there's different ways you can get into a more positive mindset and, and recognize uh, gratefulness. And I think for a lot of people, it comes down to finding a purpose. And when I say finding a purpose, that's tough for a 20 year old, I think sometimes. And if you, if, if you have, if, if you're in your twenties and you found your purpose in life, yeah. that's a great thing. I know. I don't think I found my purpose in life until my forties possibly. But yeah. once you find that purpose in life, and I really think my purpose in life is this, is helping people or trying to help people get into a positive mindset. And again, not false positivity, just right. There's, there's terrible in the world, right? There is terrible in the world every day. And there's, I mean, let's just touch on it. There's death in the world. You're going to lose loved ones. And it's not that you should be um, manic, where when you lose a loved right. one, you're still happy. That's not the goal, right? The goal is not that at all. The goal is to recognize your, your grieving, to, to go through it and, and go through the steps of grief. But through positive psychology and recognizing positivity, you can get yourself into a better mindset during those times. Not saying you're, you need to be falsely positive. You just get into a better mindset. And so you can go on living and be happy with yourself and be happy with the circumstances while still recognizing the grief for bad things. And I think to continue on this, so I, I didn't follow, I didn't finish my thought on finding purpose. I think, you know, I helped, I found my purpose through take two minutes an awful lot and helping people. And I think helping people is a purpose that a lot of individuals can get satisfaction from. You're a therapist. You, you must get some satisfaction from helping people, I would assume. Is that correct? Yeah, I to put it simply, yes. I think it's for me it's the observation of the human experience of learning and growing and sort of doing what you're doing or watching people go through that process. It is tremendously it yeah, is fulfilling. Yeah. And so I I think the the idea of helping people, a lot of people can find a purpose mm -hmm. in, in helping people and there's a there's a lot of ways of, of helping people. Helping people is not just writing yeah. an application yeah. to compete with common headspace and take two minutes. Hel <laughs> helping people is not just doing counseling or therapy. Helping people could be donating your time at a food pantry. Helping people could be donating your time at if you know if you're a church goer at your church or spirology. Mm -hmm. It's finding a way to help people and recognizing you are helping someone is a path to finding purpose. Not the only path by any means, but I think I have found it there and that helps me get into a positive space. And so there are days where I'm again in a negative space or I'm just not feeling it. And through take two minutes or getting a message uh, about how it helped them, lifts my spirits again. Now, that all comes with counters, right? I definitely get some messages like this system yeah. didn't help me at all. And those yeah. make me sad at the same time, mm -hmm. because mm -hmm. the goal is not that, but I have to recognize that there is no one thing that's going to help any, everyone. And to those people, I try to respond back with, you know, if you can expand on what you didn't like, I'm happy to have feedback and, and try to improve what I can. I don't know if I even answered your question. I think I, I danced all around it enough. No, no. Yeah, I think you did. That was great. Thank you. <laughs> I don't even really remember exactly what the question was. Um, I think what is going through my head is is maybe to, to expand on the service idea a bit more, helping people. And gratitude. I often hear this idea. What do they say? The opposite of resentment is gratitude. I tend to think a little bit more, I, I think the opposite of resentment is responsibility, which can lead to gratitude. I, I, I'm having a hard time distinguishing between, is this a thing about young people per se, or all of us? I do think there's so much, and it, it is enhanced by social media, absolutely. There's so much negativity going on, right? I mean, it, it just is the way our media landscape is. And a lot of young people, and I think there's pretty good research on this for Gen Z at least, or Z, I can't remember in Canada we say it differently. Z, I think we say here, uh, is, is, is this negativity. They, and there's a huge paradox. So we basically live in the most prosperous time in the history of human civilization. Perhaps the life expectancy stuff is turning a wee bit. I know in America it is. Anyhow. 
we life is pretty good on the surface and yet so many young people are filled with doom and gloom so i guess how do we help them i mean maybe you've already talked about it but turn or 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 attune their attention to these helpful positive grateful appreciative ways of being and maybe you already answered that maybe i'm just making a comment i'm not sure but it did anything come up for you from that little comment yeah no that's a that's a interesting uh, set of questions or thoughts so social media does a few things purposefully one is it it really works on the negativity i mean there there's been studies found that i don't want to necessarily name the names but social cer- certain social media platforms will move the negative posts so the ones that are going to create more friction and responses to the top of your list so you see those and that way you 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 get anger and you want to respond right and that through that anger and response they they create friction and get more people responding who want to be on the platform so they're almost you know trying to create negativity to get you to engage with them news is the same way and you know news works on a lot of negativity to you, you, you rarely hear in the news all the good things that are yeah. happening in the world. You hear about all the bad things, right? Because yeah, yeah. they're using that to to suck you in and make you recognize the bad, and you get the doom and gloom. Then the other things um, social media does, which has been talked about a lot, uh, cre- it makes people compare themselves to others, yes. and you're always comparing yourself to the best of others quite often. Because social media, you have all these influencers who are doing good things to some capacity, but they're always showing the best sides of them for everyone to see, which we're going to do that. That's probably our natural thing to do. I'm not saying they shouldn't do that, but what happens then is especially younger generations or people get caught up in that and start comparing themselves to these influencers they like, but they're comparing their everyday life to the best situations of these influencers, which should create more negativity or bring yourself down is what happens in that situation. And so all these things are acting upon people to, make them either more angry, more negative, more depressed, um, and not actually doing good. And I think sometimes a couple of things, I have a few thoughts here. So one is I don't watch a lot of news. People could argue that's a bad thing. People could argue it's a good thing. I definitely uh, have some good friends who give me a hard, hard time about it. Um, I, I, as I mentioned on the onset, I live in a small town. Mm-hmm. I remember a couple of years ago, there was, uh, I think, I, I shouldn't say I think, just to be blatant, there was a couple of murders in my small town, and I was oblivious to it. I didn't know it even happened. And one of my really good friends from high from college is a police officer in the area, and he called me, he goes, did you hear what happened? And I was like, no. And he goes, you don't pay attention to what's going on around you? And I was like, I, I do, but I mean, I don't watch the news. And so yeah. he kind of gave me a hard time, and he, he it's a little bit of that ignorance is bliss type thing, which can be mm-hmm. good and bad, right? You can argue that either way. Um, but I think the the balance is the key, right? I think that is what you have to do is you can't absorb all the news and let it run your life. Or if you do, hopefully you're finding a way to enjoy it and not right. create more negativity in yourself. I mean, that's the key, I think, is recognizing how it's affecting you. If it's affecting you in a negative way, making you depressed, angry, that might not be a good outlet for you to absorb you may want to shift your focus someplace else. If you're someone who watches the news and you find a purpose in life, going back to purpose, about how you want to change something and you're going to do it again in your mind in a way you're enjoying. And I, don't, I started to say in a positive way, but I think it's more in a way that you're enjoying it and not creating anger and stress from yourself, then maybe that is your purpose. And that's a good thing for you. But I think it's recognizing that, recognizing what you're getting out of social media. Now, going back to the influencers, I don't think people should stop being influencers. I don't think people should stop following their influencers. I definitely you know, on the daily, get on TikTok, I get on Instagram, Reddit, and I look at things. I just, when I do see myself being negatively affected by someone, I try to shift my focus or swipe past that, whatever you, whatever you want to call it, so that doesn't consume me. And I think that's what people need to get better at, is not letting that negativity consume them. Again, unless you're finding purpose in that, you can enjoy it without adding more negativity to your life. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. Okay, well, I'm I'm feeling some negativity with the clock winding down right now. Um, <laughs> but uh, if if there's anything kind of that we haven't discussed, uh, I've really enjoyed. Thank you so much for sharing all all this insight and 
time is always the enemy in these situations. So maybe, yeah, if there's anything we kind of haven't touched on, anything you want to kind of leave us with, and just the reminder that all your details and et cetera will be in the show notes. So people can certainly follow up with you if they want to. I'm also, do you have any free trials with your, uh, the system or how does that work? Anyway, two Absolutely. questions. First A and then B. Yeah. <laughs> No, there's a free trial. Everyone who signs up gets 15 days for free. If you don't like it, you can cancel before 15 days cool. and not be charged. It's a 15-day trial. Uh, individuals who are coaches, counselors, and therapists, uh, I do have a directory on the site. You can sign up. Uh, when you sign up, the last step asks for you, you to select a plan on that plan selection page. There's a button, I think, that says, I'm a coach, counselor, therapist. If you click that button, it gives you free access. You can add your data to the uh, coach, counselor, or therapist directory. If you add your data to the coach, counselor, or therapist directory, once I verify you are a coach, counselor, or therapist, I give mm -hmm. you uh, a year of free service for coach, co coaches, counselors, and therapists. I think take two minutes is, again, going back to that groups functionality I mentioned for parents works really well for coaches, counselors, and therapists because you, just like a parent, can create a group for your clients. You can select the clients who are going to be best suited for these activities and you can inv invite them to your group, pay for their license, but then also see what activities they're doing. I've been told so many times by therapists that I, the therapist will say, I prescribe my clients to gratitude journal, yeah. but I don't know if they are. They tell me they are, but I can't see anything. This gives you, again, a way of looking and saying, oh, look, these people are gratitude journey. They made seven entries. And also it's a conversation piece during the next session. Hey, I noticed you gratitude journal last week. Do you want to talk about any of your entries? And so I think those are all things that are good. And this is going back to the free trial, ultimately, that a coach, counselor, therapist has the a, a ability to get a, a free account to try out. Yeah, that's awesome. Cool. I'm going to sign up for that. Um, <laughs> I do have somewhat of a system of tracking, but not certainly probably not as, as effective and thorough as yours. Yeah, well, thank you, Mark, so much for everything. This is super cool. I, I I'm always so inspired by people like yourself who, I guess, find their purpose through things like this and create these super cool tools and, and things for everybody. So <sighs> I always have a hard Appreciate time the saying conversation. goodbye, but yeah, thank you again. And I wish you all the best. Yeah. It was a great conversation. Thank you for all the talks. And I uh, wish we had more time because it was, uh, it was a good conversation. I appreciate it, Mike. Yeah. Thank you so much. I am very grateful that you watched to the end of this video. Please click one of the boxes to watch more of our content and otherwise have a great day. Peace out.